Assalamu alaikum brothers and sisters wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. I'd like to welcome you all to our third session on the tafsir of Surah Al-Anbiya. Before we begin where we left off at verse number five, when you, when you come to the surah, many people when they begin studying this surah, because of the title, they have the impression that this surah is simply a, an account of prophetic stories. That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is simply going to share with us the experiences of past prophets. That it's essentially a surah that chronicles the stories of prophets. Now, Surah Al-Anbiya al is not simply a collection of prophetic stories because the Quran is not a storybook. The Quran is a book of guidance. Allah says in the Quran, First and foremost, the Quran is a book of guidance. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, in some cases, He employs the use of stories to convey certain messages to us. Now, this surah, as we mentioned in the introduction, highlights some of the experiences of the past prophets and specifically how they confronted the hostility and the mockery that they faced when they were propagating their message. Now, the reason why this surah is especially relevant to us, even though we're not prophets, is because there's this verse in the Qur'an that can help us make this connection between this surah and how it's relevant to us. In Surah Yusuf, surah number 12, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, قُلْ هَذِهِ سَبِيلِي Allah is instructing the Prophet to say, this is my way. قُلْ هَذِهِ سَبِيلِي This is my path. أَدْعُوا إِلَى اللَّهِ عَلَى بَصِيرًا That I invite, I call people to God through insight. أَنَا وَمِنَ التَّبَعَنِي دَعْوَى Da'wa means to invite people to the path of God. Now, da'wa, inviting people to the straight path, is the duty of the Prophet. It's the Prophet's task that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has commissioned him with. But in this verse, in verse number 108 of Surah Yusuf, Rasulullah says that da'wa, inviting people to Islam, Attracting them to the path of God is my, is my mandate and it is the mandate of those who follow me. That I call people to God with insight. Me and those who follow me. So the prophets. Salawatullahi alayhim ajma'een, they are the experts in the field of da'wah. But you and I, as their followers, as followers of the Prophet, we, within our own capacity, we are also essentially callers to the truth. So, even though we're not prophets, we still function as callers to the path of God. And when you call people to the truth, you're naturally going to face challenges and you're going to face hostility. And this surah essentially teaches the Prophet and teaches us how we confront and how we deal with people who are unwilling to surrender to the truth. How do we withstand the abuse, the verbal, the physical, the, this, the harsh opposition that you're bound to face. So this surah is relevant because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala expects the Prophet to invite people to him. And we as followers of the Prophet, as Muslims, we are the carriers of this message. 
We have to continue this message after the Prophet. We are the torchbearers. And because we are the torchbearers, we're also going to face pushback. We're going to face hostility. We're going to face challenges. So how do, we, how do we deal with the mockery? How do we deal with the hostility? How do we deal with the resistance, the opposition? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in this surah, one story after the other, He shows us how the past prophets dealt with that opposition. Now, in the verses that we covered last week, we mentioned that the Mushrikeen, the Quraysh, they, they used to come together, they used to have these private meetings to plot and conspire against the Prophet. And one of the things that they would say is, هَلْ هَذَا إِلَّا بَشَرٌ مِثْلُكُمْ That the Prophet is nothing but a human being. Are you going to go towards his sorcery and his magic? So they were insulting the Prophet. They were insulting him publicly and also privately. But how does the Prophet respond to their abuse? How does he respond to their disparaging language? How does he respond to the character assassination? He responds in the most dignified way. And in verse number four, as we mentioned last week, قَالَ رَبِّي يَعْلَمُ الْقَوْلَ فِي السَّمَاءِ وَالْأَرْضِ وَهُوَ السَّمِيعُ الْعَلِيمُ So the Prophet is being verbally abused. He's being slandered. How does the Prophet respond to slander? In a very poised and dignified way. He says, My Lord knows what is uttered, what is said in the heavens and on earth, and He is the all-hearing, the all-knowing. Notice that the Prophet does not stoop to their level. Rasulullah doesn't stoop to their level. He doesn't, he doesn't react to insult by, by launching insults at his, at his enemies, at his opponents. And therefore, this is something for you and I to learn. That when we do work for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, there is no doubt that we're going to be attacked. You know, people are going to question your intentions. They're going to mock you. They're going to ridicule you. They're going to, they're going to cast doubt on your qualifications. You know, you name it. You're going to be insulted. People are going to offend you. How do you respond? You always have to take the higher road. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he never engaged, he never engaged them at that level. He never stooped to their level. And therefore, we come to verse number five. Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala mentions some of the accusations. Now, this is also a lesson for us, brothers and sisters, that even Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa who was infallible, who didn't make any mistakes, he was not immune from accusations. He was not immune from insults, from disparaging you know, uh, language. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in verse number five, he shares with us three accusations that are directed to him and one request that is made of him by the mushrikeen. Allah says in verse number five, بَلْ قَالُوا أَضْغَاثُ أَحْلَامٍ بَلْ افْتَرَاهُ بَلْ هُوَ شَاعِرٌ فَلْيَأْتِنَا بِآيَةٍ كَمَا أُرْسِلَ الْأَوَّلُونَ Yet they said, confused dreams. Nay, he has fabricated it. Nay, he is a poet. Let him bring a sign like those of old were sent. Now, when you look at this verse, so the Prophet is disseminating this message of monotheism. The first, and, and some, you can even look at this as, you know, uh, an escalation in uh, the evolution of their accusations. So first, they say things like, بَلْ أَبْغَاثُ أَحْلَامٍ Confused dreams. The word أَبْغَاث is the plural. It's the jam of the word ضِغْث. It's a difficult word 
to pronounce. And it essentially means something that is jumbled up, that lacks any coherence. You know, if you grab a bunch of sticks and twigs and thorns, you know, a bunch of objects that are not connected to each other anyway, and you bring them together, that is called blighth. Abghath ahlam is basically, it's a reference to a type of dream where it's a very random, meaningless dream. There's no coherence. It's a very incoherent dream. And the idea here is that they first accuse the Prophet of sharing with them that what you're saying is just something that you dreamt about. It was incoherent. It was just a jumbled up vision that you had. And interestingly, you know, as a side note in the Quran, usually when Allah uses the word uh, ahlam, it refers to something that is, uh, that is negative, that doesn't have any basis in reality. But the word ru'ya, you know, is a true vision, like it with, the, with the dream of Ibrahim. Qad saddaqta ru'ya. So hilm is something that doesn't have any basis in reality. It's not divinely inspired, whereas ru'ya is a true vision. So abghathu ahlam, that your words, this message that you're propagating is meaningless. It's incoherent. That was the first accusation that was made. Now, when you listen to the Prophet, obviously his words are highly coherent. They're meaningful. They're profound. So that's why you see they begin with the first, because they didn't even bother to hear what he was saying. They just felt that this was going to be a threat to, their, to the status quo. They dismissed him by saying, oh, you're speaking just a bunch of nonsense. They were very dismissive. Your words are incoherent. They're meaningless. And then what do they say? بَلِفْتَرَاهُ They revise. They revise that first accusation. Because that first accusation is refuted if you just listen to the Prophet. You can't just say that, oh, what, what he's saying is meaningless. You know, أَبْغَاثُ ahlam, Confused dreams, they're difficult to interpret. Because they're so, they're incoherent, they're jumbled up. So that was the first attack that was made. But again, as I said, when you listen to the words of the Prophet, it's very clear that no, this is not what he's saying. It's not just jumbled up nonsense. It actually is profound wisdom. So it's not meaningless. It's meaningful. So that's why then they say, بَلِفْتَرَى Because dreams, a dream is an unconscious activity. But first they, they accuse the Prophet of, you know, your, your message is the product of this unconscious activity called abghathu ahlam. It's so meaningless. But the Prophet's words do have meaning. And therefore, the, the next accusation is what? But iftara. No, no, in fact, he fabricated it. He stole it from someone else. So you see that they contradicted their first accusation. If they're jumbled up dreams, if they're meaningless, how, how are you saying that it's fabricated? Because to fabricate requires conscious activity. And you just said that everything he's saying is from the unconscious activity of dreams. So they, the mushrikeen, they've already contradicted to themselves. Iftira, bel iftira means that he's coming up with this stuff on the spot. That's the meaning of iftira. Iftira is to forge something, to fabricate something on the spot. It's kind of like an impromptu response or an impromptu statement without preparation. But again, this is problematic. Some of the mushrikeen did not accept that. So, there, so the first accusation that the Prophet's words are meaningless, they're abghathu ahlam, they say, no, it can't be. It's not meaningless, it's meaningful. He must have just made it up on the spot. But then you find, what do they say after that? That even that accusation is refuted. Because the Qur'an, because his words are so refined, they are so profound, that it's impossible to just make it up on the spot. Why? 
Because when you listen to the Quran, when you listen to what Muhammad is preaching, it flows very beautifully. There's a rhythm to it. So he, he couldn't have just made it up on the spot because the verses rhyme. There's a flow to it. It's meaningful and there's style. So he's blending meaning with style. So he must be what? Because, and and we've, we haven't seen anyone to match this. So what do they say? Bel huwa sha'il. He must be a poet. He's a very talented poet. He sat down. He came up with these profound ideas. And he tied them together in a very poetic way. So even when they call the prophet a poet, they're admitting the beauty of the Qur'an. That there, that there is something beautiful about the style, about the content and the style of the words. So you notice here that the mushrikeen, they're having trouble making, they're, they're having a lot of trouble making sense of, of what the Prophet is preaching. First they say that, oh, the Qur'an is just an incoherent heap of words. Al-Baghathu Ahlam. Then, they say, no, 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 we can't, it's not incoherent. He must have fabricated on the spot. But how do you make something up on the spot that's so beautiful, that's so profound, that has such a beautiful rhythm to it? Oh, he must be a poet. So you see that even their accusations are contradictory, that they contradict themselves. Bel huwa sha'ir. And then at the end of the ayah, something interesting takes place. So they make these three accusations. And you, you also find that this, you see this in history, that whenever prophets were attacked, the accusations were always contradictory or incoherent. And then at the end of the verse, what do they say? فَلْيَأْتِنَا بِآيَةٍ كَمَا أُرْسِلَ الْأَوَّلُونَ What do they say? So they make three accusations. They say what he's speaking is the product of confused dreams, meaning it's incoherent, it's meaningless. Then they say, no, no, it is, it's meaningful, but he just fabricated it. And then they, they say, no, no, he must be a poet. So they can't even make up their mind as to what the prophet is and what he's saying. And then finally they say that, okay, if he is a prophet, they say, let him bring a sign like those of old who were sent. Now, what did they do here? This last statement they dug themselves a hole. And this shows you that when you're in a state of panic, when you're, when, you're, uh, when you're confronted with the truth and you want to make excuses, you end up slipping. And there's, you know, there's an admission of truth here. They indirect, by, by asking the prophet, bring a sign, produce a miracle like the prophets of the past. What did they do? They indirectly accepted the premise that God has sent prophets in the past. If you remember, when, they, when the mushrikeen had that secret meeting, when they used to kind of mock the prophet behind closed doors, and they would even whisper at this exclusive meeting, one of the things that they said was what? You're going to you really, you're gonna really believe what this man has to say. He's a human being just like the rest of you. Now here, when the mushrikeen say to the prophet that bring us a sign like the prophets of the past, question, were the prophets of the past human? They were. They were. Ibrahim, they all agree that Ibrahim was human. Musa was human. So, so even in this statement, they end up indicting themselves. They accept the premise 
that God has a system of guidance whereby he sends prophets. And those prophets were given miracles. And those prophets were human. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, in the next verse, what does he say? So now there's a request for a miracle. And, and you would think that, okay, if this request is granted, if the prophet produces a miracle, surely they're going to believe, right? That's because, you know, we, we've seen this progression. First you accuse him of that his message is the product of confused dreams. Then you say, okay, he fabricated. Okay, he didn't fabricate it. He's a skilled poet. Now we're coming to the end of the road. Now you're asking for a miracle. You're asking for a sign that is similar to the signs that were given of prophets of the past. Are you really going to believe if a mu'jizah is produced? What does Allah say in the next verse? مَا آمَنَتْ قَبْلَهُمْ مِنْ قَرْيَةٍ أَهْلَكْنَاهَا أَفَهُمْ يُؤْمِنُونَ No town that we destroyed before them believed. Will these then believe? Allah is telling them that you're insisting that Muhammad produces a miracle and then you will believe. That, oh, we promise that if he does, if he produces a sign, a mu'jiz, that we'll, we'll believe. We'll accept. If you just show me one, one sign, I'll accept. Allah says that those who came before you, the civilizations, the nations, the people that my prophets were sent to, they also made these requests. And I showed them the signs, and they rejected. What makes you think that you're any different than them? So earlier people, like the people of Salih, like Fir'aun, Fir'aun asked Musa to produce mu'jizat, and he did. But they never believed it. They never believed it. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying that, are you going to be any different? Allah says, I, I've seen this story before. You're all the same. Because the problem, my dear brothers and sisters, is that, you know, you can't, you can't wake someone up who's pretending to sleep. These people don't want to believe. These requests for miracles is just an excuse. They're trying to find any justification for their rejection of the truth. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, when he says, أَفَهُمْ يُؤْمِنُونَ See, Allah doesn't even address them directly. It's as though, you know when someone really bothers you, you don't want to speak to them anymore? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he says, Will these then believe? Allah is talking to the Prophet that we're, these people are going to believe? The, the people before them, we sent them signs and they rejected. And Allah says all of these past civilizations, these people that have been wiped out, it's because they rejected. Not a single one of them believed. Are you any different? And here the problem is, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala again, is basically telling them that don't claim that you're not believing because there's insufficient evidence. Because the idea here is the mushrikeen are saying that why, why has he not been given a sign like the prophets of the past? As, as, as if to say that we need more evidence. That's why we don't believe. We don't believe because of insufficient evidence. Allah is saying, no, no, no. Don't, don't try to play that card. The issue is not about insufficient evidence the problem is that you refuse to believe because you don't want to do what faith entails you don't want to give up the pleasures and the delights you don't want to submit you don't want to bow your head to a higher power because you worship yourself you worship your ego and it's a blessing brothers and sisters it's a mercy that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does not answer these requests for miracles. You know, prophets, even though they're blessings to people, they can also be 
You know, the prophets are, are described as bearers of glad tidings and warners. If a nation demands, you know, when Allah sends a prophet, yes, it's a source of mercy. But it can be also a source of punishment for you. That now you're accountable. Now you don't have any more excuse for your misguidance. So, yes, sending prophets is a blessing. It's a source of divine grace, divine mercy. But at the same time, Allah is going to hold you accountable now because you don't have the same excuse that you had before for going astray. Now Allah is going to hold you responsible. So if a nation demands a sign from God and then they are given that sign and they reject, divine wrath descends. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and this is alluded to in Surah Al-Isra, verse number 59. You know, because people might ask that why didn't, why didn't the Prophet produce any miracle that the Quraysh asked him to? Many of their requests were ignored. Their requests for miracles. Why? Because it was a mercy for them. If Allah were to have sent down a, a, an ayah and they reject, the, the case would have been closed. Allah would have completely annihilated them. Verse number 59 of Surah Al-Isra. What does Allah say? وَمَا مَنَعَنَا أَن نُرْسِلَ بِالْآيَاتِ إِلَّا أَن كَذَّبَ بِهَا الْأَوَّلُونَ Allah says, nothing prevents us from sending signs. Here, signs meaning miracles. Except that those of old denied them. Human beings, hu hu the human race has a history of rejecting miracles. A miracle is produced and they still find a reason to deny it. وَآتَيْنَا ثَمُودَ النَّاقَ مُبْصِرَةً فَظَلَمُوا بِهَا Allah gives an example of a, of a past nation that was given a miracle and they rejected it. Allah says, and we gave Thamud. Thamud was a superpower at the time. We gave Thamud the she-camel as a clear proof. But they wronged her. And then Allah says, وَمَا نُرْسِلُ بِالْآيَاتِ إِلَّا تَخْوِيفًا And we do not send down our signs except to inspire fear. That once a mu'jiza is produced, once a sign is sent, and people reject it, then there's no more excuse for misguidance. That it's a warning now. That you're at the end of the road. That if you reject now after clear proof has been presented, then you have no one to blame but yourself. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala withholding such requests, this request for signs from Quraysh ultimately represents an act of mercy to them. So as I said, these are people who don't want to believe. And, and this, you know, even though the verses are directly speaking about mushrikeen, you and I are also guilty of this. What, what does Allah need to do? What do we have to see in our lives to be, to be guided, to rectify ourselves? You know, for many of us, we think that, oh, I just, there's, if I just listen to one more majlis, if I listen to one more lecture, I'll, I'll get the motivation that I need. If the book of Allah, if kalamullah is not enough to turn your heart, there is no mu'jizah in this world that's going to have an effect on you. That, that if the Qur'an, if kalamullah is not enough to shake you, if it's not enough to inspire you, even if you were to witness the mu'jizah of Musa, after a while it would die out and it wouldn't have the same impact. So you and I, brothers and sisters, we're similar, we're, we're like this. We're waiting for this extraordinary thing to happen to forge a relationship with Allah. The mushrikeen, they wanted a mu'jizah to believe, to, to submit. 
You and I were the same. No, no, inshallah. It's as though we're waiting for something to happen in our lives to redirect us to Allah. Isn't the word of Allah enough? Isn't kalamullah enough for us? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in verse number seven, he continues, again, continuing the discussion. So you see that there's no more back and forth. You know, in the beginning of the surah, they accuse the prophet, the prophet responds. Now Allah is responding and there's no response from them. So Allah is continuing. He's building up the argument. He's piling up the argument against them. Allah says, وَمَا أَرْسَلْنَا قَبْلَكَ إِلَّا رِجَالَ النُّوحِ إِلَيْهِمْ فَاسْأَلُوا أَهْلَ الذِّكْرِ إِن كُنْتُمْ لَا تَعْلَمُونَ And we sent before you. And we did not send before you except men unto whom we revealed. So ask the people of the reminder if you do not know. Now this is perhaps a response to that first, to that first uh, comment that was made by the mushrikeen in their private gathering. If you remember that they come together and you know, they've made mocking the prophet a spectator sport. They, they come together, some of them would just listen to, uh, to others insult the Prophet. And one of the things that was mentioned at that meeting that the mushrikeen would have is that they would say, Hal hadha illa basharun mithlukum? That he's just a person. He's just an ordinary person. He's a human being just like you. So why should we, why should we follow him? So they make the Prophet's humanity the reason for their rejection of, of his message. So here, Allah says, وَمَا أَرْسَلْنَا قَبْلَكَ إِلَّا رِجَالَ النُّوحِ إِلَيْهِمْ That those who came before you, we did not send any messengers before you except that they were men who were inspired with revelation. Meaning, Ya Rasulullah, these mushrikeen need to understand that you're not the first human prophet. You know, look at how frivolous, how weak their argument is. They're rejecting you because you're a human prophet. We, we have not sent any messenger before you except that he was what? Rijal and Nuhi ilayhim. Except that they were men who received revelation. Now, here, many people ask Does this verse mean that men? are superior to God when it comes to spirituality? If all prophets are men, does that mean that men have more spiritual potential than women? The answer is no. Because nubuwa and risala, they are jobs. They are divine, divinely appointed jobs. Nubu'a is a task. It's a job. It's not a spiritual. It's not a spiritual station. To become a prophet, you need to be at a certain spiritual level. But nubu'a and risala, they're not spiritual levels. They're jobs. There are women who can have a higher spiritual rank than prophets. But they're not given the job of Nubu'a because prophets and messengers have, because of their position, it, it has certain demands. It, can, it takes a, a very strong, a very high physical and emotional toll on the person. Many prophets had to, you know, uh, lead military campaigns and Allah in his wisdom he did not give this responsibility to women but that does not mean that all women are spiritually inferior to the prophets Maryam Maryam was not a prophet 
But Maryam, so even though she was not given the responsibility of Nubuwa, spiritually, she was much more elevated than many prophets. Fatima to Zahra, alayhi salam, she's not a prophet. But is there any doubt that Fatima to Zahra, that her spiritual rank is above all of the prophets except Rasulullah? So when we look at this verse, we have to bear in mind that yes, the prophets of the past, they were all men, but that does not mean that they're all, all prophets are men because of any spiritual deficiency in, that's inherent in women. It's because prophethood as a job requires certain things that Allah de decreed that it's not something that a woman should aspire to. There are certain demands for this position that is, uh, is not suitable for a woman. So it has nothing to do with spiritual rank. And then Allah says, so ask the people of the reminder. فَاسْأَلُوا أَهْلَ الذِّكْرِ إِن كُنْتُمْ لَا تَعْلَمُونَ Ask the people of the reminder. So they can tell you about the prophets of the past. So they can tell you about what is recorded in the Injil, what is recorded in the Zabur, what is recorded in the Tawrat. Now the question is, who are Ahlul Dhikr? The Mushrikeen are being instructed, they're being commanded to ask the people of the reminder. Fas'alu Ahlul Dhikr. You obviously don't know what you're talking about. You're rejecting the Prophet because he's human. All of the prophets of the past were human, they were men. Since you don't know that, ask Ahlul Dhikr. Now, who are Ahlul Dhikr? Different opinions. Some of them they say that it's the learned people from the Jews and the Christians. Meaning that you don't know about the prophets of the past, go ask the rabbis, go ask the priests and the monks, and they will tell you about the Anbiya of the past. Is this who is meant by Ahlul Dhikr? There's a narration from Muhammad ibn Muslim. Muhammad ibn Muslim was a student of Imam al Baqir and Imam al Sadiq, one of the most prolific scholars, hadith scholars of the times of the of, uh, al Sadiqain, al Imam al Baqir and Imam al Sadiq. Muhammad ibn Muslim, he says, I went to Imam al Baqir, our fifth Imam. Qal qultu lahu. He said, I, I said to Imam al Baqir, I asked him, Inna min indina yaz'umuna anna qawla Allahi azza wa jal fas'alu ahla al dhikr in kuntum la ta'lamun annahum al yahud wa al nasara. Muhammad ibn Muslim says to Imam al Baqir that, O oh, grandson of the Prophet, there are those among us, among the Muslims or even among the followers of Ahlul Bayt, who believe, who claim that Ahlul Dhikr is a reference to the Jews and the Christians. Is this true? Is Allah telling the Muslims, Fas'alu Ahlul Dhikr, go ask the Jews and the Christians if you don't know? Imam al Baqir alayhi salam, what does he say? Idan yadrunakum ila dinihim. That's not what is meant by the verse. Because if God were instructing us to refer to the Jews and the Christians, the Jews and the Christians, they would invite you to follow their religious tradition. Allah wants to guide you. He's not trying to push you in a direction that will make you susceptible to misguidance. The Imam then says, ثُمَّ قَالْ Muhammad ibn Muslim says, ثُمَّ قَالْ ثُمَّ أَوْمَأَ بِيَدِهِ إِلَىٰ صَدْرِ Muhammad ibn Muslim, he says, Imam al-Baqir then pointed to his chest. And he said, نَحْنُ أَهْلُ الذِّكْرِ That we, the Ahlul Bayt, we are the people of the reminder. Because we know about the past prophets better than the monks and the rabbis and the priests. We know the Injil better than the monks and the priests. 
We know the Torah better than the rabbis. Allah is going to say, go ask these people who have a distorted text in their hands. People who reject Rasulullah, go ask them. And then the Imam, he gives a proof. Now you may say, Ahlul Dhikr means Ahlul Bayt. How is this possible? The Imam says, Walidhikri ma'anayan. The word dhikr in the Quran is used in two contexts. There are two usages of the word dhikr in the Quran. Faqad an Nabi, one of the Prophet's names in the Quran is dhikr. Where in the Quran? Imam al Baqir says, Faqad summiya dhikran li qawlihi ta'ala, dhikran rasula. In Surah Al Talaq, Surah 65. Verses 10 and 11, the Prophet is described as dhikran rasula, a reminder and a messenger. The Quran is also described as dhikr in the Quran. Allah in the Quran, He says, Inna nahnu nazzalna dhikr wa inna lahu lahafilun. We have sent down the reminder and we will surely preserve it. And then the Imam says, Inna, He says, وَهُمْ The Imams of Ahlul Bayt وَهُمْ أَهْلُ Quran. So we Ahlul Bayt, we are the Ahl of Quran And we are Ahlul Nabi So when the Quran says فَاسْأَلُوا أَهْلَ الذِّكْرِ ذِكْرِ It either means the Prophet Meaning the Ahl of the Prophet Or it means the Ahl of the Quran And either way the, the Ahlul Bayt, they are at the forefront of being Ahlul Quran. They have the most knowledge of the Quran. And if dhikr means the Prophet, then Ahlul Bayt, they are the Ahl of the Prophet. And therefore, if you are ignorant in any, on any matter, Allah says, Fas'alu Ahl al dhikr. Ask the people of remembrance, the people of the reminder, if you don't know. Verse number eight, again. Continuing this discussion on the humanity of prophets. Verse number eight. And we did not make them bodies that did not eat food, nor were, nor were they immortal. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala saying that prophets are human. They are recipients of revelation. But Allah says, I created them in a way where they eat, they sleep, they have human, they have the same bodily needs as you need, as you have. And you find interestingly that throughout history, it was the humanity of prophets that was one of the main reasons why they were rejected. In Surah Al-Isra, Surah 17, verses 94 and 95. وَمَا مَنَعَ النَّاسَ أَنْ يُؤْمِنُوا إِذْ جَاءَهُمُ الْهُدَى Allah says, and nothing prevented people from believing when guidance came to them except إِلَّا أَنْ قَالُوا أَبَعَثَ اللَّهُ بَشَرَ الرَّسُولَ Did God really send a human messenger. So can you imagine, brothers and sisters, that many people rejected the prophets of the past because they were too relatable. Because he, the prophet eats and I eat. The prophet gets married and I get married. The prophet gets sick and I also... So why him? Why not me? In verse number 95 of Surah Al-Isra, قُلْ Allah explains why prophets have to be human. قُلْ لَوْ كَانَ فِي الْأَرْضِ مَلَائِكَةٌ يَمْشُونَ مُطْمَئِنِّينَ لَنَزَّلْنَا عَلَيْهِمْ مِنَ السَّمَاءِ مَلَكًا رَسُولًا Allah says, tell them that if the earth was inhabited by tranquil angels, if it was inhabited by malaik, Allah says, I would have sent down an angelic messenger. 
Because in order to be a role model, you have to be among, you have to be from the people that you are guiding. How can you emulate someone who does not share your basic nature? If Allah appointed an angel as a prophet or a messenger to be our role model, do you know what's going to happen? People are going to say, oh, I can't do that because I'm not an angel. These, these angels don't eat. They don't sleep. They don't know what I experience. They don't know the pain that I feel. They don't know the struggles that I endure. So Allah says, I, if, if the earth was inhabited by angels, I would send angelic prophets. But the earth is inhabited by people. Allah wants to guide human beings. So He sends who? He sends human beings. Surah Al-Furqan verse 7. وَقَالُوا مَا لِهَذَا الرَّسُولِ يَأْكُلُ الطَّعَامُ وَيَمْشِي فِي الْأَسْوَاقِ Surah 25 verse 7. Again, the mushrikeen, they say, what kind of messenger is this? He eats food and he walks in the marketplace. Meaning he's, he's normal. In Surah Al-An'am verse 9, Surah 6 verse 9, وَلَوْ جَعَلْنَاهُ مَلَكًا if if, we, if the Prophet ﷺ was an angel, if we created him as an angel, Allah says, if Rasulullah was an angel, we would have to transform him into a human being in order for him to be a role model for you. So even if he is an angel, we have to reorient him. We have to say, Kun fayakun and make him human in order for him to serve as a true guide for human beings. So here, look at how much importance Allah places on how, how important it is for the, a prophet to be relatable. And this is also a lesson for us, brothers and sisters. You know, if we want to guide people, if you want to teach people, if you want to attract the youth back to Islam, you can't talk like you're from outer space. You can't talk all theoretical as though you're detached from reality. You have to be relatable. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala always chose prophets who were relatable, who came from the villages that they were sent to guide, who were familiar with the language and the customs and the cultures of the people that they were sent to guide. So that you have to have something in common with them. And then Allah says at the end of the verse, وَمَا كَانُوا خَالِدِينَ And we did not make the prophets immortal. Now even though this, this wasn't brought up, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is essentially refuting an argument before they even make it. So they already made the argument that, oh, you know, he's just a human being and you know, why should we believe in a prophet who's human? Allah's already addressed that. It's the issue of relatability that he has to be human for him to serve as a guide and as a role model. And Allah says, and we also didn't make them immortal. So when they die, you cannot say, oh, I knew he wasn't a true prophet because he died. Allah says, no, I have decreed death upon every human being. Even the prophets die. The only one who is the living who does not die is Allah. Allah is al hayyul qayyum Allah is the living who does not die. Every other creature is going, to taste, is going to taste death. So don't even think about saying that, oh, if the Prophet dies, we're going to have that I got you moment. Oh, he died, Muhammad died, I knew he wasn't a real Prophet. Allah says, no, we did not make them bodies that do not eat food, and nor did we make them immortal. Allah in Surah Az-Zumar verse, verse 30 explicitly says to the Prophet, إِنَّكَ مَيِّتُونَ وَإِنَّهُمْ مَيِّتُونَ Ya O Muhammad, you will one day die. You will perish and they will also perish. In Surah, in surah Al-Anbiya in verse 34, and we're going to come to it, Allah says, وَمَا جَعَلْنَا لِبَشَرٍ مِنْ قَبْلِكَ, من قبلك الْخُلْدِ O Muhammad, we have not granted immortality to any human being before you. You're going to die just like Ibrahim died, just like Isa died. 
you're all going to perish. And that should never be used as an excuse to reject the prophets. Because Allah is the only one who's eternal. And I'll, I'll conclude with this. There's a beautiful statement about from Imam Amir al-Mu'mini about this idea of death. That, that you know, some, you and I, we think that everyone else is going to die except us, at least practically. You know, we think, oh, my, my cousin's going to die. We, we don't think about our own death as though we're the only ones who are immune of it. Imam Amir al-Mu'mineen, he says, and this is an important hadith to think about. He says, وَلَوْ أَنَّ أَحَدًا يَجُدُ إِلَى الْبَقَاءِ سُلَّمًا If there was anyone who had, and the Imam uses imagery here, if there was anyone who had a ladder that would take them to eternal life. أَوْ لِدَفْعِ الْمَوْتِ سَبِيلًا And if there was anyone who could repel death, لَكَانَ ذَلِكَ سُلَيْمَانُ بْنُ دَاوُودِ if there was anyone who had a chance, who could have lived an immortal life, who could have diverted death, it would have been Sulaiman. It would have been Sulaiman. Sulaiman was a prophet, he was a king, and he had human beings and jinn who were subservient to him. But even Sulaiman. Even Sulaiman died. He passed away. So Allah says, I have not made any messenger, any prophets who do not eat, nor have I made them, nor have I made any of them eternal. Inshallah, with that, we'll conclude our session for, for this evening. Alhamdulillah. Uh, yeah, this, uh, this verse on emphasis on prophet being relatable. It, it just really ties in to the need for us to have scholars like yourself who've grown up in the West and are familiar with this environment and this culture. Alhamdulillah. I mean, I just I consider myself a student of knowledge. So if I can share anything that is uh, that you find useful, and that's from Allah's na'mah upon us. But uh, yes, I mean, I definitely, you know, being relatable is important for prophets and it's important for us as educators you know we want when we want to teach those who are younger than us we have to understand the world that they live in we have to understand the culture you know we have to be at least semi-familiar with pop culture so we can uh we can provide uh you know comprehensive uh guidance otherwise you know we're gonna we're gonna fail and it will be because of our lack of basira and because we just you know we're ignorant of the times so this relatability is, is critical if someone wants to be a, a leader, whether it's you know, at the level of the ummah or even be a leader in your own home. Being relatable is, is really important. Yes. And uh, uh, on the verse, talk about, talk about zikr, where we said that, uh, that the zikr was really referring to the imams. Uh, it, it makes sense what you're saying when it's like the zikr is, an interpret is referring to the imams for uh, the later times, but um, what the imams wouldn't, couldn't have been the, it doesn't, it's not, it's not like that the imams would have been the intended meaning for when the verse was revealed, because the imams were not there or known at the time, so yeah. what would the verse have been referring to during those times? So, so during the time of the Prophet now if there were members of the Ahlul Bayt who were alive during the, uh, during the time of the Prophet. So you have Fatima to Zahra, you have Imam Ali ibn Abi Talib, who are Ahlul Dhikr. So in every, in every era, you have certain members of Ahlul Bayt who are among Ahlul Dhikr. So now you may say, look, okay, why don't they just ask the Prophet directly? Fas'alu Ahlul Dhikr. It seems that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, even during the time of the Prophet, wants the Muslims to get into the habit of referring to the family of the Prophet. Even in the, even in the presence of the Prophet, you know, getting them into the habit of referring to Ali ibn Abi Talib, to Fatima, to Zahra. Because just like the Quran says, the Prophet is going to die, he's going to perish. So creating that relationship between the Muslims and the Ahlul Bayt, who are Ahlul Dhikr, 
is, is important to establish during the Prophet's life. So, yes, the other Imams were not present, but even during the lifetime of the Prophet, Ahlul Bayt were there, at least in the, in the form of Fatima to Zahra and Ali ibn Abi Talib. When uh, related to the Surah Yusuf uh, verse 108 that you mentioned in the very first verse, yeah, uh, talking about Dawa, you know, today when we're talking about Dawa, we're usually referring to people converting people to Islam, and the definition that you're referring to uh, sounds like it's a lot more general. Yeah, I mean, Dawa def definitely in its general sense refers to, you know, on one level, inviting people, calling people to God, is taking them from the world of disbelief to the world of belief, from, from whatever they were following before to Islam. But even within Islam, it's possible to do da'wah in the sense that you bring people closer to God. So for example, someone who might be sinning, they might be sinning. They're Muslim. You're not inviting them to Islam. You're inviting them to abandon things that are distance, distancing them, them from God. So by encouraging them to avoid sin, you're calling them to God. By encouraging them to repent, you're calling them to God. By encouraging them to do some of the mustahabbat, to perform salatul layl, this is a type of da'wah. You're inviting them to go beyond the basics. So, so inviting people towards any act that brings them closer to God is on some level a type of da'wah. So you have general, you have da'wah for non-Muslims and you have da'wah for Muslims, people within Islam. So we as followers of the Prophet, within our own capacity, within our sphere of influence, we should be calling people to God. And Imam al-Sadiq salam in a famous tradition, he says, Kunu du'atan al-sinatikum. Be silent callers to God, to the path of truth. Meaning that let your conduct, let your behavior be a form of da'wah. You know, and the most powerful way to guide people and to inspire people is to live the message yourself. You know, so for example, if you want to invite your family members to pray Salatul Fajr, invite them by having them observe you pray Salatul Fajr. If you want people to pray on time, if you want your family members to pray on time, invite them by turning off the TV and then you stand for a prayer. Sometimes you don't need to say anything. Your conduct, your godliness is, becomes a form of da'wah. So sometimes we, we think that da'wah, you know, I have to be articulate, I have to know what to say. Sometimes it's not about speaking. That you're, the way that you live your life is, becomes a type of da'wah. Your presence, you know, people who are very close to Allah, who are spiritually refined, believe me, just sitting in their presence is da'wah. You feel drawn to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So yes, so the concept of da'wah is, is much more broad than just bringing people into the fold of Islam. I thank you very much, Shaykh. It was a very insightful lecture. Jazakumullah. Please keep me. Inshallah, I pray to Allah that this is a surah that uh, that is inspiring and enlightening. And inshallah, we all uh, we all get the opportunity to benefit. Inshallah. Inshallah. So keep me in your du'as. Inshallah. Khuda. Maasana. Wa